Hey guys, I'm Crystal with the Dog Psychology and Training Center. This is my husband, Eric. We are going live today to talk about how to get your dog to listen to you 100% of the time. Um, it's a common complaint we hear a lot about families um, that their dogs are basically what we call selective hearing, right? If you, if you jiggle the, the treat bag, then they are um, uh, you know, running towards you, sprinting over to see what's going on. And if you tell them to come here or sit down, they're like, oh, but did, did you see the sky is really blue today? And kind of like our kids. Yeah, very much like children. <laughs> um, so we have some tips and advice that we're going to um, throw out at you today. And we're hoping to get some feedback from you guys as far as questions, concerns, what we can specifically address for you and your dogs. What's going on at your house? Tell us. We want to know. Uh, so, for those of you just joining on, again, a quick recap, we are going to um, be talking about how to get your dog to listen 100% of the time. I'm Crystal, this is my husband Eric, we own the Dog Psychology and Training Center, and we are going to be sharing some dog wisdom today to talk about um, consistency and getting your dog to um, obey. Um, and that just sounds really mean, getting your dog to obey, but we want them to listen because, one, you're a human so you're smarter. Two, you know what's safe for them. Running out into the street chasing a squirrel is not safe. Um, and so you also, oh, here, normally you use my phone to see what's yeah, going on. Yeah, that way uh, I'm We're like trying to read comments in. <laughs> Looking all weird. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about those things. So um, the number one thing I have is, and throughout this, I mean, it's very low-key, so just, you know, post in the comments. And if we don't, um, if you don't join us live, you miss us, that's okay. Um, we will be checking the comments for the next 48 hours. So um, keep posting your comments and letting us know, and we'll keep responding to them and um, trying to help you out that way too. So don't feel like you're too late to post a comment at all. Um, but number one thing I have is to be consistent. I always tell people dog training is simple. Simple doesn't always mean easy. It does take work. It does take effort. Um, but you have to be consistent. If you give a command, you have to have follow through. What is that follow through and how are you going to enforce it? So a lot of times people um, will say, well, give me, give me an example uh, that sorry. we hear a lot from families. They were uh, calling us about their dogs not listening. Oh, just Let's role like, play. Let's role play. You be a client. So, like, my dog is like the smartest dog on the planet. It's cute as a button. Knows, knows how to sit, knows how to do it down, comes when I call them, does all this stuff, except for when they decide not to. So I don't know what to do. Our clients don't sound like that, by the way. We have really great families that we work with. Uh, but he went from like being a female voice to kind of like a child's like so, so what do I do? Um, what, 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 what would you have me do? Because uh, he listens no, most. No, we're Rocky. Are you Rocky? Yes. No. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I say, I call my dog. I say, Yo, Adrian, <laughs> come over here. And most of the time, she's like, All right, all right. And then other times, she's like, She's like, No, nah, no, nah, nah. And we do, we do hear that a lot. Not from Rocky. Um, we have not had Rocky. As a I client. wish if anybody calls. And does that voice for the whole phone call, you get a special prize. <laughs> <laughs> to gonna be like, determined. We're going to have a lot of Rocky impersonators it's calling us. It's probably going to uh, be like a, just a heads up, it's probably going to be something like a Mr. T bobblehead. A Mr. T bobblehead. Because <laughs> we have those laying around. We will find them. I'm sure, I'm sure they're sold we in bulk you. on eBay. We got you. Impersonators call us. Um, but but back to we do things. hear that. We do hear that a lot. And what it comes down to is just the follow, th follow through. So, um, you know, in, in life, not just dog training, but in life, there's always motivators. There are positive no motivators that reward us when we make good decisions and keep us making those decisions. And then we also have negative motivators that are consequences to our actions. Um, so these are just ones I'm throwing off the top of my head. Um, speeding tickets. Can you tell somebody's had a little bit of too many speeding tickets? Um, those are a consequence, right? If you're going above the speed limit and you get caught, there are some consequences and they can be rather expensive. So 
um, when I am driving and I get my lead foot pushing down and I see that speedometer, I'm like, ooh, let's, let's just come up a little bit there. Um, because I don't like those consequences, right? They're not painful to me. I'm not afraid of them, but there are consequences. Um, and then positive uh, motivators would be like, um, you know, eating a chocolate donut or a piece of cake. They feel so yummy in your mouth. Um, and so, you know, that's a positive motivator. It makes us want to do that. Or going to work every day, um, when you get that paycheck, that's a positive motivator. You want to keep going back to get your paycheck. Um, so with dog training, what are positive motivators and what are negative motivators? And how can you use these to get your dog to listen consistently? Um, so negative motivators, those are our consequences, right? Um, things that interrupt naughty behavior or have consequences to a dog outright disobeying a behavior. Um, and they should never be fearful or scary, but they should be something that makes your dog think twice about performing that action again. And they vary from dog to dog. So he was talking about dogs being similar to kids. They really are so similar and that they all have their unique personalities, regardless of, of breed, of age. They are all so different as an individual and so you have to learn who that is, who is that individual, what is their personality type, what is their love language, so to speak, so that you can properly reward them in a way that they understand and want to be rewarded. Um, and you can also use that love language to understand um, what's gonna get through to them as far as consequences. Um, and so when we talk about dogs, positive motivators, the most common one is treats, food, right? Everybody likes food, including dogs, um, but, there are some dogs that don't care for food. They're not food motivated. They don't have what we call food drive in the dog um, training world, but they just, they don't wanna work for food because food's not their happy thing. Um, for those dogs, it might be toys. You have a special toy for your dog. That is a great reward. Um, and then one of the most over, or I'm sorry, underrated um, acts of positive motivators is, right there, hands, pet right? Petting your dog, physical touch and, and verbal praise to them um, can help them um, want to please you. Um, and so using it in a way, again, that your dog understands. I don't know if you guys have read the book by Gary Chapman with the five um, love languages, but um, you know some of the love languages on there are you know words of affirmation, verbal words, praising your dog, saying, good dog, good dog. Um, one of my favorite personal dogs that we had to train was one of our, our first pit bulls named Corbin. He didn't work for food, he didn't work for treats, he didn't even work for petting, he worked for good boy. Like you told him good boy and he was like doing backflips. He was over the moon like, yeah, is that, is that what you want? Okay, I'll do that again, I'll do it again, just tell me good boy. Um, that, was his, that was his love language. It almost sounds too easy, like silly, but, but really like w right. when, you'd say, when you would say good boy, like the the wiggle machine right. just the turned on. Oh my goodness! And that oh. tail would turn into a whipping machine and leave <laughs> welts on you. But he was so happy. Um, and then you know, for Morgan, our mastiff, food is not her thing. Toys, she doesn't really have much energy, so she plays for like two seconds and she's done. Um, and again, words of affirmation, she'll sleep through it. She really doesn't care what you have to say. But she loves physical touch. She, like her love language is physical touch. You pet her, you like touch her in any, like she could be sleeping you could touch, on the floor. Just touch her. You could poke her <laughs> as she's sleeping and all of a sudden her tail just <laughs> as she's sleeping. Um, so finding your dog's you know, love language, what works for them, what motivates them is really key to helping you set the, the tone for those rewarding and positive um, you know, rewards for good behavior. Absolutely. And then for those negative behaviors, like not listening or not understanding even, um, there's, there's consequences in life, right? So what can those consequences be for your, your dog? Um, if they are playing too rough with a toy and with another dog and, or they're destroying it and that's a rule you set at your house, they're not allowed to destroy toys, but they're allowed to chew on them and throw them. Um, and it, that's doable, by the way. Yes, it is. Just... You don't have to buy a bajillion toys. And I mean, dogs do, their natural prey, you know, predator instincts are to destroy those toys. That makes them feel vict, just, what is it, victory? Victorious. Victorious, yes. But that's not necessary. Um, so they don't have to do that. And we have toys that they can destroy. 
And then we have toys like Kong, so they're not allowed to destroy. They're allowed to toss them and chase them, but they just can't sit and chew. Side Ten note. Tennis balls, back. too. Tennis balls, too. Yes, tennis balls are uh, a strict throwing fetch toy. Yeah, because... Not a popping in your mouth with one bite oh, from a pit bull toy, because we went through a lot of pit bulls. Yeah, we got sick of buying those tubes balls. every every other week <laughs> uh, and, and picking up tennis we, balls. We so. literally bought, like, a box of, like, 50 from eBay <laughs> oh, one yeah. time, because we were going through them so fast. Ah. Um, and and so, then that was the last time we bought them. Yes. We decided... We're not buying tennis balls anymore, so our dogs now, they can play, they'll play with the tennis ball, but they won't destroy it. Yep. So, you can't teach that. But that's that's for that's for another video. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Side we're, note. We're, so, back to ne consequences, right? Negative motivators. Neg negatives. What um, helps dogs learn to make proper choices, right? Because there has to be a reason to make a good choice. Not just because you said right. so. Right. Um, and so. Because otherwise, you could speed all day long, get get places faster, get a thrill. Why would why would you not, why would you not always do that? I would, uh, if I there would was never no such thing as speeding speed tickets. If there was not speeding tickets. I would never not speed. Is that I would a improper? Never grammar? not. Never not. Never not. Never not speed. That's me. Never not going to uh, say that again either. <laughs> <laughs> so um, figure that out. So negative Eight. motivators, consequences, what what could those be for your dog? Um, so for Morgan, hers was physical touch. If she was being um, you know, really naughty, I could withhold that physical touch. And it could be for an hour, it could be for a day. Um, a day is kind of pushing it, but it could be longer term. And when I say withhold, that doesn't mean I'm never going to pet her in that hour or that day, but I'm going to be selective about the times that I give it to her. It's not going to be free. She's not just going to come up and I'm going to touch her and love on her. Um, but it could be, you know, she did do a... Uh, command she did listen she did do something polite and then I would actively go up and touch her and, and reward that um, so you can use that um, other other um, cor you know uh, interrupters or consequences could be um, can I can I stop you stop me and I would say to that note uh, and we've probably talked about this before on other videos but it's it is very important that you not like for Morgan touches her love language we want to make sure not to touch her and love on her and pet her when she is doing something that we don't want her to do. Mm -hmm. So if she's, uh, you know, if you've got a dog that's jumping at the door or um, begging for food, jumping on somebody's lap, you know, running circles around your guests as they walk in the door, if you don't want them to do that again, like don't, don't, touch don't them reward them for that. Mm -hmm. So if their love language is, uh, you know, verbal uh, words of affirmation, uh, then you don't want to say, it's all right, bud. It's cool. It's blah, 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 blah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're saying good boy necessarily or not. Like when you're talking to them, they know you're talking to them and they love that. So you're essentially rewarding them. You're reinforcing that behavior. So I just wanted to throw that in there because we see a lot of people do that. And uh, your dogs are always learning. It's just, are they learning to do what you want them to do or are they learning to do what they want to do? Mm -hmm. That is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So... Keep that in mind. Yes, and that being said too, your dogs are more sensitive to the consequences of their love language. So mm -hmm. um, for Morgan, you know, not we'd never recommend hitting your dog, um, but if, if you were to hit a dog whose love language was physical touch, it would really be um, more personal and more offensive to them um, because that's their love language. And the same thing for dogs like Corbin whose love language was words of affirmation. If you yelled at him, he shut down. He would cr like crouch down on the ground and like be like so pitiful, the pitiful pit bull, um, because you raised your voice. You had we had to be careful with our tone. It's one thing to be firm, no, sit. It's another thing to be like, no, sit. And he'd be like, oh my gosh, like he would literally melt. So um, be careful with your words of affirmation. I mean, with your um, consequences when that is your dog's love language, because dogs again, they're different. You have to know wh what's that that line between what's an acceptable you know, consequence and what's too much. We'd never want it to be too much, just like with kids. You know, our daughter's love language is words of affirmation and there have been times where she has startled me with her interactions with her brother and sister and I've been caught off guard and I'm like, Lasco, no! And instant tears. She just starts bawling. And then I can't talk to her because she's just so overwhelmed with that negative verbal tone of my voice that I have to calm her down before I can even talk to her. Um, and then our son, I mean, goodness gracious, you could yell at him all day long and he doesn't hear you. His love language is physical touch. So when we have to deliver consequences, we grab him. We sometimes sandwich his little cheeks in between our hands so that we're touching him and he's looking directly at our face. Because if he's looking over here and you're talking to him, he does not hear a word you're saying. So find your dog's love language. And just like you have to uh, 
um, balance your, your consequences and your rewards for your children, you have to do the same for your dogs. So consequences, I keep kind of getting off on my tangents, but consequences could be withholding, um, you know, toys, treats, attention, words. Um, it could be um, something more, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but... Um, more serious? More serious, maybe. Um, more you know, it real. could be a tug of the leash. So if you say, come here, and they're just, you know, totally oblivious, staring into space, you could give that leash a little tug, and that represents touch, right? Because you're tugging them, it feels that pressure on their neck, and they're saying, huh? Oh, were you talking to me? Um, if you have a remote trainer um, and you are using it, um, that is a great tool, um, not as a correction tool, but as that communication, right? Verbal communication is really important. With dogs, touch is really important. Um, and so with the e-collar, the great thing about it is it lets you be able to touch your dog um, from a distance, up to a half mile. I don't think you're ever gonna be that far away from your dog, but you might. Um, we've never, we have five acres, but side note, um, with the remote trainer, when they have uh, you know, negative thoughts going through their head, like, ooh, look, there's a squirrel across the street, and you say, come, and they don't hear you because now they're super excited, their, arousals, you know, their, their arousal level has gone up, they see the squirrel, and they're just over the moon about it, and they're ready to bolt. With the e-collar, you can just give them a little tap and say, hey, Morgan, I was talking to you. I said, come here. And she's like, oh, oh, I didn't hear you. Okay, here I come. Um, and so that it's can fantastic. be... fantastic that can be a consequence um, you know she didn't listen to me I had to touch her to get that attention and interrupt that that thought process and redirect her back to me um, another correction or a consequence could be something annoying um, we used to use and still do for some some families that works for them um, those little compressed air cans that you use to clean out your computers and your keyboards uh, you don't put the little hose thing in just spraying that can um, not at your dog, you know, it's not a, it's not a gun, don't spray it at your dog, but just spr spritzing it at your side. Um, that, that sound that Eric just made, that psh. It's um, just the, the audible uh, right. interrupter. And it's a unique sound that your dog doesn't hear in everyday um, communication. So when they're having that naughty thought and you say come and they're just like, I don't hear you, I'm just focusing on this squirrel. You do that sound, they're like, oh, oh, were, were you talking to me? Okay, here I come. And, and they run over. So that is another interrupter. Um, tool that you can use. The air horns that are really annoying at sporting games can actually be useful for dogs. Yeah, um, if you can stomach that. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a dog that barks outside and you're saying, you know, enough or quiet, whatever you want that command to be, and they just keep barking, 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 uh, as loud as you can yell, you're probably still not going to be louder than them barking. Barking's pretty loud. Um, the air horns are great um, to get their attention back, right? So not because your neighbors would probably shoot you, but just a quick Maybe. and they're like, oh, 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 you're talking to me? Okay, yeah, here I come. Um, so, you know, you have to have some sort of consequence that for your dog is enough of an annoyance to make them choose those right decisions. Um, and again, you have to be fair, you know, don't ask your dog to do something that's unfair, but what's fair and unfair? For me, as a mom, as a dog mom, as a human mom, um, when I say something, I mean do it. Not because I'm mean, not because I'm a bully, but because I know it's safe for you. That squirrel may look really fun to chase, but it's across the street. And I said, stop or come here because Because there's an 18 wheeler coming right your way. I don't want you to get hit by a car. Um, and so consequences can have those, those negative associations. So for example, with our, our kids, my son, my daughter always checks the mail. My son wanted to go one day, they're four and five. And I'm, you know, I'm that creeper mom, so I was hiding behind the bushes watching them, making sure they were minding the, the boundaries from the street in the yard. And my daughter did great. My son, he looked at the street, he looked at the mailbox, he looked at the street, and I could see the wheels turning, and he ran into the street. So here I come busting out of the bushes, and I run over, and he was only like three, I think, at the time. And I swatted his bottom. He was wearing a diaper, but I swatted his bottom, and of course, because his love language is, is physical touch, that little swat was not, I mean, literally, it was like, it was like that. It was not even enough to, like, hurt. But just that, that thought of it, that startlement of it, was enough to just make those waterworks happen, and he was so sad. And I said, listen, buddy, that was hard for mommy to do. I didn't want to give you a spanking, but if you were to get hit by a car, that's a way bigger boo-boo that mommy and you do not want. And that was enough of a consequence, and how I know is the next day he wanted to go check the mail. I said, sure, go ahead. Again, creeper mom hiding behind those bushes, watching him walk out to that, that, that mailbox, and he looked at the street, 
and he looked at the mailbox and looked at the street and then he walked back to the house. That was enough. If I would have went over to him and said, Raider, no, don't, don't go out in the street, he would have looked at me and maybe acted like he heard me. But then the next day, he's probably going to go out oh, in the yeah. street because that consequence wasn't enough to make him think twice about going into the street. Um, and so that's a big one for me as a mom. That's life or death, right? So I want to make sure that he gets it. That's a big message that I want to make clear that we do not ever go into the street unless we have a mommy or a daddy or an adult present and we look both ways. And there's so many rules that we have to teach a, a small child. The, the same is true for a dog. They say dogs have the average IQ of a two-year-old. Raider was three. That's pretty similar. I'm not saying spank your dogs. Don't do that. Um, that's a bad <laughs> idea. Um, dogs have teeth and they might bite you back. Uh, but there are other consequences that you can deliver, like a tug of the leash or using that air can or something that's enough for them to be like, <gasps> ooh, yeah, I did not, I don't like that. That was startling. That scared me. I don't like that. And make them think twice about doing it again. Um, so that's the whole point of it, right, is making sure your dogs are safe. That's why we want them to listen. It's not about our convenience and about making our lives easier, although that's a nice plus. It's about making them safe. We don't want them to get hurt. We love our dogs. We get our dogs to love on them and for them to be a part of our family. We want to keep them safe. So um, positive motivators, negative motivators, and consequences. Um, and then the consistency. If sometimes you... Yeah, how do we get our dogs to listen 100% of the time? Mm -hmm. That 100% comes with 100% consistency. If you have a younger puppy or even an older dog that has not had you know, that consistency put into place. If you can't watch them like a hawk because you have mom duties or because you are reading a book or a newspaper and you just get really into it and just zone out and don't see anything else, um, it's okay to put your dog in the crate for 20 minutes or an hour so you can get things done without letting them make bad choices. If they make bad choices and you didn't catch them, they just realize that it's okay sometimes. Mm -hmm. And It's kind of like a, would you say it's kind of like a teeter-totter? Like the more they're able to do bad behaviors mm -hmm. the more they kind of feel like it's okay to do that yep. but if they're never given the opportunity to make those behaviors then right it's like a scale yeah how, whatever weighs the most is how they think so right now it's probably weighing a little heavy in the i can sometimes I can do what i want this, and then sometimes mom gets mad but sometimes she doesn't care because you didn't see them um and so they think that's okay mm -hmm. but as you start to catch them a hundred percent of the time or as much as humanly possible because really we can't ever get to 100 percent consistency but as much as humanly possible that scale will start to tip and then you'll have the you know the heavier side is oh you know what every time i do this one thing mom always catches me and she always tells me it's wrong or there's always consequences whether they know it was coming from you or just life um they get it so you know a, a natural consequence would be a dog chasing a bee looks really fun it's buzzing it sounds cute it looks cute it's a little yellow black and white thing our black and yellow thing we chase it and we try to bite it and guess what ouch Ow. that sucks yeah that um, sucks. and if you've ever seen a joyous puppy or dog chasing a bee they just have like that joy in their face and they're just happy <laughs> and they're spritzing <laughs> and then they get the consequences of a bee the next time they see a bee they're like nope nope <laughs> ain't, ain't doing ain't that Right? It didn't. It didn't kill them. Although some dogs do have an allergic reaction, and maybe that wasn't the best analogy. It could. could. Um, but if your dog doesn't have an allergic reaction, um, you know, it's not enough to kill them, but it is enough to make them be like, ooh, I did not like that, and I will not chase another bee. Yep. Um, and so, you know, God puts those natural consequences out there for a reason, and as a parent, as a dog parent, as a dog owner, we need to have consequences for our dog's actions too, to make sure they're safe, to make sure they don't get harmed by another dog, to make sure they don't harm another dog, that they don't harm a child. And by harm, I don't mean, you know, just aggression. It could be, you know, they play too rough or they knock a small child down yeah. because they didn't stop when you told them to and they just bolted right for him and plowed into him. You know, those are all things that you need to manage as a pet parent. It's your responsibility to one, advocate for your dog and then advocate for your dog's surroundings. What do you need to be managing that is, you know, pertinent to your dog to learn those rules of that area? So. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of, I think, um, you know, in, like I said, we, we get a lot of calls and we talk to a lot of people, families that they, they have dogs that are smart and they are legitimately smart and they do understand. Gosh, they're, smart. they're so smart. They are. They understand what these things are that we're asking them to do, but they choose not to do them. But do you always make sure that they do it when you ask them to? Or do you sometimes, you know, uh, most of the time, you know, I make sure that he sits, but 
but sometimes like if somebody's at the door I don't or if it's dinner time you know I don't worry about it yeah it's like oh so yeah I kind of just let them slide sometimes well I mean we we got to really consider that how important is it that they listen well then it's equally important that we are totally consistent and we we make sure Mm -hmm. that we follow through with the commands that we give I'm just gonna add to that this is not a forever thing You don't forever have to watch your dog like a hawk. You forever have to watch your dog. But temporarily, during this training phase, Mm -hmm. you do need to watch them like a hawk, and you need to interrupt them and help them make right choices and then praise them with that love language that makes them feel whole and happy to teach them that um, this is what happens when you make good choices, and this is what happens when you make bad choices. And when you make a bad choice, guess what we're here for? Not just to scold you and say that was bad and walk away, but to say, hmm, we don't run out into the street. You know, when I ran out and swatted Raider's bottom, I didn't just leave it at that. I said, we don't step on the street unless mommy and daddy is with us, right? And then walking with him to the street and having him hold my hand and saying, okay, buddy, let's walk or walk across the street. I'm so proud of you for holding my hand. That was a great choice, right? The same thing with your dogs. If you say, come, and they, they do, make a big deal about that. Like, wow! Wow, I'm so proud of you. You did such a great job. If you say come and they don't, have a consequence that they understand, right? We don't want it to be harsh or, or, you know, terrifying, but enough to make them be like, ooh, yeah, mm, I didn't like that. Um, And then show them what they should have done. When I say come, you turn on a dime and you come. Yeah, and this... uh... I'm not sure if we were super clear on this, but this is this is after your dog totally understands the stuff. This is right. after the learning phase. This right. is when your dog, you know that your dog understands what said command means, right, right. and they are choosing to. Right. Not fair yeah. to be yeah. like, yeah. Um, what's a, let's say plots. And your dog's like, what? Well, I told you. I no, told plots. you. Do it. And you start freaking out. They're <laughs> like, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, plots is German for um, a down command for a dog. Um, but that's that's basically how it is with a lot of families is they just expect their dogs yeah. to know without actually teaching them or showing them what it means and then getting angry at them for not understanding. So Eric's absolutely right. Yeah. Make sure they understand first. And we get it, guys. We get it. We have three little ones under five. We have a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a soon-to-be two-year-old in like Next four week. days. Um Time flies. Oh my gosh, she was just a little baby. Anyways, um, we get how crazy life can be, right? We get it. We get like, I mean, if, don't ask Eric because he'll probably tell you honestly, but I'm crazy. I don't. <laughs> I lose it. I get so overwhelmed as a mom, as a dog trainer, as a everything, right? Because we're human, right? We have moments where we're just like, I need five minutes to myself. I'm going to the bedroom. And I just want to sit here and I don't want anybody to talk to me. We've been there. And that's why we're here to help. That's why we do dog training because we get dogs. We get it. We're good at it. And we have those hawk eyes like no other. So when a dog comes here, we have the same random craziness that happens at your house. They come and stay in our home. They get to be exposed to random people at the door with their kids being, you know, throwing tantrums or playing rough and running around with food in their hands and having dirty, stinky diapers that some dogs like to smell a little too intently, if you get my drift. Um, And we are here to show your dogs that when chaos happens, you still have to have your manners. Yeah, you yeah. still are responsible for making good choices so that when they go home to your crazy life, they're like, oh, I've been through crazy and I still have to listen. Mm-hmm. I get it. Mm-hmm. Because dogs know when you are frantic because someone's at the door or your kids are having a meltdown and your dog's getting away with something, they're going to know, oh, mom's attention's diverted. I don't have to listen yep. right now. I can get away with this. Um, and so yep. we, we are there to show, you know, when our kids are having a tantrum or when somebody comes to the door, our priority is not the kids having the tantrum or somebody coming to the door. I don't play with tantrums. You have a tantrum, I just walk away. Uh, <laughs> mom of three, been there, done that. I'm out of <laughs> here. Come talk to me when you stop crying. Um, but the, the dogs see that and they think, oh, I can jump. I can jump on this person at the door because you're, you're trying to get your kids to do something or whatever. And I turn around and say, no. That's not allowed. And you need to sit or hold your place and follow through with those consistencies. Don't think your dog does not understand what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Because, like like Crystal said, dogs have the average IQ of a two-year-old that totally, totally knows this stuff. Which, to be honest, I think two-year-olds are underestimated nowadays. So We much. don't expect them to do as much as they're capable of, but they so are much. capable of so much if you teach them and show them how to have that responsibility. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. to wrap it all up, well, we do have one question. Um, Good. We do have a question about uh, biting. Okay. Okay. How do we stop biting? But just real quick, um, 
Or yeah, let's do the question. Let's do the question, and then I have one thing to add at the end. Okay, okay, let's okay. do this question. Question is, tips on getting puppies to stop biting. I love it. I love it. Um, well, it depends on the age. If it's a puppy under six, they are... Six. Six months, thank you. <laughs> Not six years, six months. Six hours. Uh, six <laughs> Um, so under Too small months, for a prong collar. <laughs> the reason I say that is because those puppies have a legitimate need to chew, right? Just like babies' teeth to cut their teeth, puppies' teeth to cut their teeth. So you want to have a wide variety of toys. When I say wide variety, it doesn't mean 50,000 teddy bears. No. A variety of textures. You want to have a soft plush toy, a hard rubber toy, maybe a hard plastic toy, um, a rope toy. All of these things are really important for the different stages that a puppy goes through through teething. So soft toys um, massage those gums and help them when they're really sore with those teeth, teeth about to break through the surface. Um, those soft rubbery toys help actually massage that tooth out you know, through the skin. Um, and then those hard toys actually help kind of um, prime those teeth and help pull those gums back away um, for that development. So all of all the, the types of toys you have are really important. And then to redirect them from humans, there's a couple different things you can do. Um, if they're biting on your hands a lot, um, I just turn my, my hand up when they start biting my thumb. I just turn my thumb up and I tend to have um, stiff nails. So when they bite Long down, <laughs> when they bite down, they're like, oh, I kind of look at you. And I'm like, it's a natural consequence. I don't want to say anything. I don't act like I did it. I mean, really, I did it. It was just a consequence. You bite my hand, there's a nail. I'm it bit sorry. something sharp. Sorry, don't Duh. do that. Um, and they may do it a couple times, and then they just look at you like, well, that sucks. I'm not doing that again. Um, if they're biting, you know, feet and socks and legs and pants as you're going by. You run away. <laughs> Eric, tried that one. Ah, don't do it. Short story. What happened? Corbin, that wonderful pit bull we were talking about, he was a puppy teething. And he didn't do it intentionally. They were playing chase. <laughs> and Corbin was chasing him and caught his pant leg. Go ahead. He cracked his tooth. I think it was a tooth that was ready to fall out anyways. And just bad timing. And Eric was running and he caught it on just the right timing with the pants legs. And just... Pretty sure it ripped my pants too. It did. And there was a lot of blood. It was bad. Yep. Uh, he was fine, really. I think we were more offended than he was. We, we were feeding him like ice cubes and stuff because we felt so bad. And he was just loving all the attention. Like he had like no pain from it at yeah. all. Um, but we felt really terrible. So uh, we're, we're those sappy pet parents that are like, oh, I'm so sorry. Come here. Um, that but was a joke, though. Don't run away. Don't run away. So what, what if they're biting your feet? So there's a couple different things. Remember I mentioned taking the leash and doing tugs off, you know, that firm no with the tug. And they stop and look at you and say, oh, what a good boy. Here, let's go get your teddy. Here, let's go get your rope. Let's go get your bone. Yep. Redirecting them and showing them what's appropriate to chew on. It's so important to show them what's appropriate and then praising them for making that right choice, even though you guided them to make that right choice. But what that does is it helps your dog be independent in the future when it sees that squishy, you know, toe that it wants to chew on, they'll start to walk up to chew on it and they'll be like, no, no, I can't, where's my toy, where's my toy? And it'll find that toy, and that's where it's super important for you as that member having those hawk eyes saying, oh, what a good boy for chewing on your bone because you saw him make that thought process of that, toy, that toe looks super yummy, no, no, okay, toy, toy, I gotta find a toy. That's a really important like hallmark moment yeah. to, to uh, mention and isolate and make a big deal about for making proper choices. The other thing I like, I'm a mom, right? We ain't got time. Um, so what I like is um, what they call teething repellents. You can buy them at pet stores or on Amazon. Um, there's bitter apple, which is 20% ethanol, I think, which is like an alcohol. It's really bitter tasting. Um, it does evaporate after some time. Um, but if you apply it liberally, um, it really works really well to stop the teething. And the other one is fooey, which is based, um, it's cayenne pepper based. So yeah, they learn real quick not to chew on that too. Now there are some unique dogs that like the taste of bitter apple or that like the taste of fooey. Some dogs like peppers, just like some people like Weird cayenne ones. peppers. Um, <laughs> but those are really great because with, especially with small children yeah. who squeal, like squeal and scream and sound like giant squirrels, that just makes your dog want to chew. <laughs> more and chase more 
Um, <laughs> We've got one of those. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, we do. Um, Actually, do. We, I was going to say we probably have more. <laughs> uh, but what we what you do with the bitter apple, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, they'll just spray it on something, and then six hours later, your dog will find it and chew on it and think, oh, it tastes bad, but it doesn't taste that bad. I'm going to keep chewing on it because it, it's evaporated. Remember, I said that 20% ethanol evaporates. So what you do is you spray it in your fingers right here. I'm trying to make there we go. So it's like a little puddle. And then you just swab it in their mouth and on their tongue, and it's really gross. And it's it's kind of like a little guilty pleasure thing because they're like, <laughs> they're like wiping their tongue. You're like, sorry. And then when they get the scent of it in the future, they're like, no. Yes. That's and disgusting. so when you spray it on something like your hands or your socks, um, and they go to chew on it six hours later when it started to evaporate, that smell or even that subtle taste of it that's remaining is enough to make them think, oh gosh, that no. that was a really bad memory. I don't ever want to go back to that. Um, and so that is why we spritz it on your fingers and swab it first. Um, That's important. Very important. And then you can literally, when we had, before we had our own kids, um, when our puppies were younger and chewing on people, uh, we would have our nieces and nephews and Eric's little sisters, we'd spray it on our hands like lotion and kind of rub it on our arms and I'd kind of slap it on our cheeks a little bit and our chin right here and then spritz it on our socks and the puppy would come over and start gnawing on us and they'd be like... <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, and they would go over to the next person and try, you know, nibbling on their chin. Yep. And they just basically learn that everything, like people, um, tastes gross. And really the only thing that tastes good is their toys. So be very important not to get any of this on their toys. Um, <laughs> but that's what you want to show them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The consequences in life that everything tastes gross except your toys. And you can spray it on, you know, your table legs, your furniture. It always says test it, you know, in a, a secret spot in the back that you don't see every day in case it discolors it. We've never I had it. I don't think we've ever had it. No, we spray it on everything. <laughs> and we don't, nice. we don't have it discolor anything. So, but, you know, test it first so you're not mad at us. Um, but yeah, we spray it on everything. And you gotta apply it liberally, like I said. So on humans, maybe several times a day. On inanimate mm -hmm. objects, maybe yeah. once a day or twice a day. Um, and then be consistent with it for about 10 days to two weeks. And if you're consistent with that, that's enough tries for your dog to be like, nope, it forever sucks. I'm never going to do that again. If you skip a day and on day eight you forget to spray and they chew on it and it tastes good. Consistency. They're going to realize mm, maybe sometimes it does taste good. So you're maybe I telling should. me there's a chance. That's exactly it. That's exactly <laughs> it. So consistency. Take okay. away all hope. Did that answer the question about chewing? Was it chewing on people or objects? I don't uh, know. Just I think I puppy stop biting, but same principle. I think, yeah, biting same would principle. be more biting probably towards people is what I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? Well, there, Did you check the other side? There, um, there was one other thing that we weren't planning on talking about, but I was thinking about it as, we, as you were sounding so good mm -hmm. explaining things. Mm -hmm. um, so when we, we, we talked about when you give a command, you need to be totally consistent. You need to follow through. You need to make sure that they do that command mm -hmm. if you want them to consistently yep. listen to you. So we actually have a curveball for that, don't we? I have no idea. Our <laughs> casual commands. Yes, thank you for that. That's yes, a great one. we weren't even thinking about this. So one thing, so I always say I'm, a, I'm the mom dog trainer. Um, I get life is crazy as a mom and to have kids and dogs is a handful. Um, so we, our job is to make your life as easy as possible with a well-behaved dog. We're still working on the kid training, uh, if you know anybody, <laughs> yeah, if you know anybody, send them away. But the dog training, we got below. down. We got dogs down. <laughs> Kids, we're still working on it. Um, but so, like Eric said, we have our casual commands. So let me let me start with talking about our formal commands. Do you, we're at thirty-seven minutes? Should we maybe should we do this on the next week or another week or should we? That's a great idea because I was thinking we were going a little bit longer. We're going long, long but we okay. have so we here's have a test here or not a test um, a tease. Huh. Teaser. Mom brain. Uh, so teaser would be, next week we're going to talk about formal commands, casual commands, and commands that just make your life easier. Yes. Yeah, you guys are going to like that. Yes. You guys are going to totally like that. It's for mm -hmm. those scenarios where you want your dog to do something, but you don't necessarily want to enforce it. follow through. Yeah. Ha! We have a curveball. We so, have a command for you. You better be here. Just saying. Be here or be square. Your choice. I don't know what that means. Can somebody tell me what that means in the comments? I would love that too, because I was thinking that too. I yeah, was, isn't it? It's it's. It know. always pops in my head because people say that, but I, I never want to say it because I don't even know what it means. I say it a lot. And I have no idea what it means. So somebody, somebody like, teach me your way. Maybe that's like, uh, squares like a like okay, a. I think it's because they're perfect. Uh, well, no, maybe like a, a a not hip person. Isn't that what square means? Well, it was Is like it, the you're cool a square. Club. Like, yeah. if you're not there, you're know. not you're not know. cool. 
Your I square, like, which is excluded let me, from... Let me just tell you what kind of movies I like to watch. Cry Baby. Old Johnny, Johnny Depp, right? And uh, yeah. uh, Ricky Lake. Yeah. Yeah, really old. <laughs> uh, that's like the only time I remember hearing somebody say, like, be there, be square, or don't be a square. Maybe they talk about it in Greece. We should watch Greece to get... She's not a Greece fan. I'm a Greece I'm fan. I'm not. I like Cry Baby. You almost never sung that. Though. I'm not a Greece fan. You, that's what you said. <laughs> She really is. She just doesn't want to admit it. I'm not. But seriously, I'm um, Grace lover. I think we kind uh, of know what what the concept means now that we talked about it. But I'm not totally yeah, positive. Yeah, seriously, somebody who knows what square means, let us know. Um, and then we'll talk to you guys next week. So, See Crystal, ya. Eric, Dog Psychology and Training Center. Next week we're talking about formal commands, casual commands, and commands that just make your life easier. We'll see you guys next week.